everyone. You're listening to Michelle Speaks on 180radionow.com, currently heard in over 128 countries around the world. And I'm your host, Michelle Portier, founder of Healing Women, Healing Nations of Northeast Florida. We live in a society that condones living behind masks, hiding who we are and the issues we face, some too taboo to discuss with anyone. You may be worried about being judged or ashamed of what others may be thinking of you. Michelle Speaks not only uncovers it, but we look for solutions to deal with it head on. Stay tuned as we get to the heart of the matter, because if you hide it, you can't heal it. Welcome to this week's episode of Michelle Speaks. If you hide it, you can't heal it. No topic is taboo. Today, we are going to be talking about educational disparities. Hmm... So I advise you to pull out your pens, put on your thinking caps, sit back and just take in some knowledge. Today we have the very phenomenal, dynamic Dr. Diane Clark as my special guest. Not only is she my guest, she's my spiritual leader. She is an amazing woman of God, but she is just an amazing woman. When you think about the Proverbs 31 woman, think about Dr. Diane Clark because that she is. Before we get into finding out a little bit more about Dr. Diane Clark, I want to give you an overview of what we're talking about, why, and what we can do to get to the heart of the matter. So the No Child Left Behind Act, a major education initiative from the Bush administration in those days, was intended to raise educational achievement and close the racial and ethnic achievement gap. Its strategies included focusing schools' attention on raising test scores, mandating better qualified teachers, and providing educational choices. Unfortunately, the complex requirements of that law failed to achieve those goals and have provoked a number of unintended negative consequences, which frequently harm the students. The law is most intended to help. Among those consequences are a narrowed curriculum focused on the low-level skills generally reflected on high-stakes tests, inappropriate assessment of English language learners, and students with special needs, and strong incentives to exclude low-scoring students from school so as to achieve test score targets. In addition, the law fails to address the pressing problems of unequal educational resources across schools serving wealthy and poor children, and the shortage of well-prepared teachers in high school needs. A policy that would live up to the law's name would need to address these issues and reshape the law's requirements to enable the use of assessments and school improvement strategies that support higher quality teaching and learning. Locally, the FCAT was implemented with the same process in mind. However, statistics indicate that process fails our students, especially in our underserved communities. So what can we do to initiate change? Let's get to the heart of the matter. So thank you again, Dr. Clark, for agreeing to come on and share with us today your wisdom and your knowledge. Thank you, Michelle, for inviting me to be a part of Michelle Speaks. My pleasure, my pleasure. So what I want to do before we get into the meat, I would love for you to share with our listening audience, who is Dr. Diane Clark personally, professionally, and spiritually? Well, Dr. Diane Clark personally is a grandmother of six wonderful grandchildren wow, wow. that I love. I love them so much. I wish I could have had them first. Right. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but we know that's not possible. It's not, but right? I kind of had that thought too. <laughs> yeah. I've only got two. Skip but, yeah. the whole children thing and just have the grandbabies. Right, but right. I'm, I'm Lex, a if you're, if you're listening, Lex, I was joking. <laughs> Lex is my daughter from the, for those of you that don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, well, it is a joke. It it's is not meant it to is. hurt them. It's just that the the babies have a totally different concept of grandmother, right? Than than we have between mother daughter son well. mother relationships. And I'm just grateful um, 
personally to be alive. Amen. I've had two near-death experiences that the Lord mm. brought me back from. Wow. So I am just excited every day yes. to give my life to Him to yes. use as He please. Mm-hmm. So I'm invigorated. I, I am excited. I'm on the move. I'm launching forth in everything that God is doing on a cutting edge society. So when you look at Dr. Diane Clark personally, you find someone that's witty, fun, loving, personable, and easy to approach. I agree with that. (laughs) All of the above. (laughs) Professionally, I have a doctorate in Christian psychology Mm -hmm. and my focus is developing programs and initiatives that will help people improve the quality of their lives. Professionally, I've written several programs Mm -hmm. for low income housing communities that that were geared toward education and Mm -hmm. dealing with the disparity in underprivileged or underserved communities only to find that all they really needed was a voice. Mm. And when you get a voice, then you collectively gather voices and you can bring change. Um, I think one of our most successful programs that we had was the Education Academic Arcade. Okay. Academic Arcade was held in one of Jacksonville's poorest neighborhoods where there was a lot of crime. Okay. And in the Academic Arcade, we set up the most recent video games, the most everything that was state of the art at that time. And the children had to read a book mm-hmm. or learn to read okay. in order to play on the games. Okay. And that became very popular. Wow. Uh, we saw FCAT scores increase. Okay. We saw families becoming better educated. Gotcha. Not only academically, but health and religion. Overall. So, so prof- they, that was an incentive for them. Yes, ma'am. Gotcha. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So professionally, my passion is to help people improve the quality of their lives. Wow. And spiritually, I'm a pastor mm-hmm. of Kingdom Life Ministries. And just recently, um, we entered a transition mm-hmm. where we're bringing all of our spiritual components together. And it's going to be called The Well. I love it. <laughs> because people, you can always draw from The Well. Yes. Mm. Yes. So we, we are combining uh, Kingdom Life Ministries, which is the worship component. Right. We're combining Pride in Action Community Services, okay. which is, of course, community service oriented right and then we're combining my mentoring and coaching program that's called empower you love it and then we have kingdom institute love it so when you come to the well whatever is missing in your life Mm. we're there so that you can draw life into you yes yes i love it so there you have it for my listening audience that's just an overview of who dr diane clark is she is dynamic (laughs) and we are going to draw from her today much wisdom and much knowledge and the tools we need to help initiate the change in our underserved communities. So with that being said, let's get right into the heart of the matter. So Dr. Clark, is there such a thing as educational disparities in the community of the underserved versus the privileged? Yes, Michelle, unfortunately, there is a lot of disparity in the underserved communities. Even with the initiative of No Child Left Behind, Mm -hmm. it created a different class system Mm -hmm. so that uh, segregation was put in place, not by skin color. Mm -hmm. So the new segregation is green. Mm. (laughs) With the educational system, Um, Families, children are divided by the income, Mm -hmm. where you can live and what's available to you based on where you live and what you make. So when when you look at that and they've did. They've done several studies about schools functioning with textbooks that were out of date, right. um, using leftover material so that they had the quality of education that those children were receiving mm-hmm. did not empower them to compete in corporate America. Right. And then they enhanced the technical program mm-hmm. in high schools. They, they've had technical programs all along, right. but they've not been as vivid as they have become to where now you have whole 
host campuses mm -hmm. that's nothing but technical training mm -hmm. and what that does to a young mind that that feels hopeless that feels left out that feels underserved excluded uh-huh excluded mm -hmm. what happens is they move toward a technical education mm -hmm. as opposed to an academic track okay. so we we've, we've turned out people doing nails and doing hair uh doing feet maybe working on cars mm -hmm. But the areas where they could improve financially, they walked away from right. to do these things. And everybody knows when there's a crisis or just like we've come through Irma right, with hurricane. the hurricane, right. uh, there weren't many nails getting done. Not at all. So your, your business didn't prosper right. in the face of a crisis. The hair but, salons. Yeah, the hair salons. But the banks kept running. Right. Credit unions kept running. Right. And had you been the president of a bank or president of a credit union. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in, in that disparity in education, what I see and what I viewed and often voice was that we stopped giving children opportunity to compete yes. academically in a corporate society. Okay. And when we did that, of course, we increased crime mm -hmm. because if I'm not geared to a technical institution and I'm not geared to an academic institution, mm -hmm. then I become vulnerable for the next quick thing right. to make money. Right. And it is unfortunate, Michelle, in many communities that our young men are selling drugs and because they're giving the mom money mm -hmm. to help pay the bills. We're talking about underserved right. communities. The mother doesn't report it. Mm -hmm. She doesn't try to um, redirect the child because indirectly she's being helped. She's trying to survive. Yep. By, by sacrificing the, the, ch the children mm -hmm. and, you know, ind indirectly, unconsciously, however, mm -hmm. but just in, in survival mode. Yeah. So yes. we've seen a lot of that. So if you're selling drugs and you can make three or four, five thousand dollars a week mm -hmm. or over a two week period, there's not much I can motivate you right. toward education or, or even to get a technical job. Right. So this disparity uh, existed long before Bush mm -hmm. brought the No Child Left Behind. Right. And it's no secret right. that all over the nation mm -hmm. there's been a disparity in education mm -hmm. in underserved communities. I wanted to go back and kind of touch on something that you said. Um, number one, the one thing I wanted to touch on is when you talked about the voice all that was needed was a voice yeah and so if children aren't heard then they're going to go and find and seek some place where they have a voice and if they can't find that then they're going to create it and that just kind of made me think about what you talked about with the mom accepting mm -hmm. you know money from a drug dealer and the children seeing mom and dad suffer want to do their part to help alleviate that so they will be drawn to that mm -hmm. so how can we draw them back well every reformation mm -hmm. everything that produces change mm -hmm. on the earth starts with the voice mm -hmm. and that voice has to be loud it has to be strong and it has to have a message from that voice, you gain many voices mm -hmm. binding together to create change for a cause. And what we're seeing is spar sparingly leaders rising up to address the issue because a lot of them, their children are already graduated from right. school, already right. graduated from college, or they're otherwise engaged in employment. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what the voice meant in our generation right. doesn't mean the same thing in this generation. Right. We have younger mothers mm -hmm. now and grandparents are raising children mm -hmm. so you don't have the PTA representation that's mm -hmm. needed. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a voice at the PTA meeting that's saying I know that my child is not getting adequate 
information. They're right. just being trained to take tests. Right. Where they're they're not learning. Such as the FCAT. Mm-hmm. Right, right. They're trained to pass tests mm-hmm. because then it makes your standards look good. But that does not necessarily mean that the child is learning. Right. And how does that benefit that child in the long run to come out and go into the community and be pro- a productive citizen, prospering citizen, not just a productive citizen, but yeah. prospering individually and collectively, which is what we all want. And so I love the way you put that. So one voice that has one that is loud, <laughs> yeah. that is strong and has a message will yes. create many voices. Yes. And we have pockets of leaders mm-hmm. rising up. Mm-hmm. To be an individual voice, but what can we do to bridge the gap to bring those leaders together to create the many voices that we need to address? Michelle, you're speaking about bringing unity Mm -hmm. between um, people who are in power, are in roles of leadership Mm -hmm. that feel they have the answer. And oftentimes, unfortunately, our pride. Mm. will cause us not to listen Mm -hmm. to someone else who has the answer. Okay. Because nothing is going to get done with just one person. Right. You can look at uh, Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. Uh, He changed the face. Yes, he did. Of America with his voice. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when, when you look at that, and you see leaders popping up sparingly mm-hmm. who have a voice. Mm-hmm. What has to happen is the re-education of why you have that voice. Okay. You don't have that voice to become great. Mm. You don't have that voice to be looked upon as as someone to be revered or or to be worshipped. Okay. You have that voice to incite other voices to begin to herald the message mm-hmm. of bringing equality and bringing a system of education whereby everybody is learning and having the same opportunities. And you said a mouthful there. And so what we need to do, what we should be doing is those collective pocket of individual leaders as we see that they're rising kind of pull them under our wings for those that are more seasoned and help them to understand or re understand that it's not about them it's about the message and the impact that we want to create for not just our this generation of children but the generation of children that are to come behind us so basically you're saying it's not all about you no yeah, so drop the pride. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I love it's it. about generations to come. And you know, Michelle, mm-hmm. uh, one of the detriments of it all is that ignorance is so pervasive. Mm. And, and not just among the underserved, but even those who are privileged. Right carry a level of ignorance Mm -hmm. about the world and society Mm -hmm. that keeps them from reaching out to help another. Mm -hmm. And you know, in our culture, it's very difficult to get someone who has quote unquote made it Mm -hmm. to build a bridge for others to come across. Gotcha. What they usually build is a wall Hmm. that you have to learn how to navigate to get over. Mm -hmm. So when you speak of um, bringing them under your wings or helping them to re-educate, it usually takes a crisis mm-hmm. or, or tragedy right. for them to rise up. You, you you have the mad dads that grew from a tragedy. Right. You have mothers against drunk drivers mm-hmm. that came from a tragedy. And the right. question really is, what is it going to take? Mm-hmm. Because now you're dealing with the younger mother mm-hmm. who, who, who is dealing with a blindness mm-hmm. within herself about her purpose. Right. And why she's here and why she even had the children. Right. So they're not being educated at home. Right. They're not getting the nurturing at home, at home that causes them to make a demand mm. in the community of education. And that just opens the lid to an even greater problem because, you know, and I've heard this often growing up, you know, and I believe it to be true. It all begins at home. So if there is this dysfunction in the home, mm-hmm. then how do we begin to 
attack or address that dysfunction, even coming from the privileged community, because I know there are there are many in the privileged communities that want to reach out and help and want to embrace and want to be part of that change. But they don't know how they don't how to make they don't know how to establish the connection. And then many of them are unbelieving that the dysfunction is is to the extent that it is. So how do we begin to kind of address that? Again, we're back to a voice. Yes. And we need web presence, internet presence like we have with this radio station. Mm -hmm. We need people who can see what is missing Mm -hmm. and not just point out the problem but come with the solution. Solution. Mm -hmm. So we need solution driven individuals that will rise up and say this is the answer to that situation Mm -hmm. and and have a loud enough voice so that they can be heard with one message that's Mm -hmm. clear Mm -hmm. that brings resolution. Not one voice with many messages but one message. One message. One message. And you know Michelle not to mention um, because this is like contemporary this mm-hmm. is contemporary front front porch kind of stuff right now yes and what I'm going to say uh, it might aggravate some people in radio Speak freely community but Speak freely. dealing with the, no the topic is immigrant taboo. situation mm-hmm. right and we have so many nations in our nation mm-hmm. you're talking about a disparity in education mm-hmm. We're dealing with uh, people who don't speak our language Mm -hmm. and having to communicate to them what's needed. So now you're not only uh, having disparity among one one race, Mm -hmm. you have a disparity among many races Mm -hmm. at the same time. And it's increasing the poverty level of cities Mm -hmm. and of states Mm -hmm. because not only uh, are they not being well educated academically, but let's look at the health system. Mm. You know, you come here, uh, if you're diseased or or you need medicine, you need care and you don't speak. Right. Mm -hmm. It cuts off the access. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we need more advocates than complainers. It's easy to complain about something. Mm -hmm. It's a bit challenging to become an advocate for it. So when that's another disparity in our community Mm -hmm. and something we've done in our city, we've actually pooled the different immigrants um, into communities where they kind of live together. Right. We've created community for them and it has its good points and And it has its negative points. Because it's still segregation. Still segregation. And I still say segregation is not about black and white. It's green. Yes. That's the bottom line. So they're here, the yeah, and they they come in. We give them credit. Mm-hmm. You know, they're buying houses, they're buying up the gas stations, they're buying the hotels. Mm-hmm. You've been here all along, right? And you can't buy a bicycle. Mm-hmm. You know, if you offer to give the people a ride every day, right. it's it's uh, it is that's another disparity. And then when you flow over into health, mm-hmm. people who don't get regular checkups, they don't know about getting regular checkups. They're not aware of what's available in the community. Mm -hmm. They're not educated about um, wellness programs, we care programs. And so they they get in the system of Medicaid or Medicare. But there are other systems that can be just as beneficial to them. There are other resources available. Yes, if we would make the information available. available. Mm -hmm. So... In a sense, what I'm hearing, we're here to talk about educational disparities, but it's a much larger issue because everything is connected. And I've always said, I always wonder what my mom meant by that for many years. She was like, everything is connected. And I didn't get it. Only over the last, I say, six or seven years have I completely gotten the full meaning of what she was trying to share with me. Because if you are not properly nourished, that's health. Mm -hmm then you're not going to be able to retain what you're learning in school. No. If you are worried about a roof over your head, food on the table, then you're not going to be in the right mental state to be educated because you're worried about 
health, food, you know, housing. So it's all connected. And then if you're not aware that there are resources out there that can help you or you get discouraged because when you seek the help, what they determine to be a poverty level, you don't qualify for the things that you need. So it's a much bigger, bigger issue. And so I believe if we can just attack it one by one, attack the major thing that connects everything, then Mm -hmm. we would better be able to have a viable solution that's not going to last for a season or, or, you know, a, right. a, a, a set amount of time and then we're right back to square one. Right. We've got to seek to change a generation. Yes. And not just one community. Right. We've got to look across the face of a generation because the, the academics and, and Michelle, I don't know if you've noticed um, a lot of the millennials are opting not to go get a four year degree. Mm-hmm. They're opting not I've to go to college. Mm-hmm. So that has that has created um, colleges and universities, you know, go at your own pace. Right. Uh, you could finish this in nine months and mm-hmm. make $40,000. Right. You can do this. And you have to look at the message mm-hmm. that's being sent to the young mind that this at this type of education will go on me. Yeah. Yeah. Going. This will give me instant money. Right. But. You know, I might be the next senator Mm -hmm. or the next vice president or president if I pursued an academic track. Right. But if I drop out to make the money, Mm -hmm. then I'm going to miss opportunities that may have been available to me had I followed an academic track. And often in underserved communities, Mm -hmm. that information is not available to them. Or if they do get to college, when they graduate, they are in so much debt Mm -hmm. from student loans till it's depressing when they get their first job. Right. And not only that, when you when you bring up the, the, the topic about loans, many of them that I've encountered, they're not aware that they can get apply for grants. You know, that's money that you don't have to pay back. Right. And it's totally dependent upon your gender or your being, you know, a minority. And then that just fur- that just further um, makes them feel like that their dreams and their goals are unattainable. And so I think my question would be, how do we get them off of the focus of money and more on the focus of how can I make a difference? I don't know. I guess myself, I've always been one about wanting to be sure what I'm doing is making a difference. It's going to impact others. But I believe that's because that's something that my not only my mom, but my grandmother instilled in me because my mindset is even after I've made the money and I've arrived and I've achieved this, now I've got to struggle to keep it to maintain it and sustain it and now I begin to wonder those that are around me are you around me because of me are you around me because of the impact that we can make in the community together or the nation or are you around me because of what I can give you that's I know that's a whole nother topic but that's just what that brought to mind but those mindsets Mm -hmm. are birthed from disparity Mm mm-hmm a lack of proper information Mm -hmm. and training. Um, When you look at that, you you have a wonderful mom, a wonderful grandmother, in that they taught you the things that were needful Mm -hmm. at home. Mm -hmm. When when you look in the average household now is one parent, several children, Mm -hmm. or grandparents raising grandchildren, Mm -hmm. and they don't know where the mother is mm-hmm. or, or, or where the father is. So you're in a society and a culture um, that's run by debt. Yes. It is profitable for our nation to keep us in debt. I agree. Okay. So everything around you says you need money. You got to have money. Mm-hmm. You can't participate in anything without, without having money. Mm-hmm. So when you speak about educating or retraining or affecting the, the 
the thinking and the mindset of young people so that they aren't so geared and focused on money. I really don't have a solution, Mm -hmm. you know, to to say, well, this would help them. I do know if they get Mm reeducated and and learn their purpose. And I don't think people seek out their their purpose. purpose. I don't think they seek out to know, you know, why am I really here? Right. What what have I been sent here to do? Mm -hmm. If we would get um, acquainted with who we really are Mm -hmm. and what we've been sent to do, I think we'll see a difference in a lot of areas where there are disparities. But when you're in a society and a country that promotes debt, that promotes money, um, and then now even the reality shows, the movies, um, it's all geared toward greed and money and lasciviousness. So it's subliminal. Yes, ma'am. It's been piped in. Right. In in the music, it's piped in through television shows. And so when, when you sit down a person who does not have the capacity or the ability to apply wisdom to the knowledge that they get, Mm -hmm. they will not be able to navigate successfully in in a society that we've developed in, in our country. So, and that was, again, another mouthful. And, you know... I'm always thinking about how can we affect positive change? How can we not broaden the gap, but eliminate the gap that we have between our underserved communities and our privileged communities? How can we bring them together? And you said it earlier, unity Mm -hmm. um, and educational disparities is just the tip of the iceberg, but we have to start somewhere. And so with that being said, what can we do, you know, to empower parents in the underserved communities to push for the same opportunities for their children as those privileged to children, positioning them to succeed at a rate equal to their peers? How, how do we as parents? As parents, I believe, let me say, I believe mm-hmm. that we need to become more involved mm-hmm in the lives of our children. And you can't wait until they're teenagers Mm -hmm. to, quote unquote, raise them Mm -hmm. or train them. It it has to start at an early age. And in many instances, a lot of parents aren't equipped Mm -hmm. to really bring the change that's necessary in the household with the children. Mm -hmm. I still believe you have to have a leader. Mm -hmm. You have to have a voice that's heralding a message, Mm -hmm. a message that's so on point that it begins to impact every person that hears that message. Mm -hmm. And so as community leaders, as as working in the community as we do, then, you know, it becomes um, almost an assigned task Mm -hmm. for us to engage people that we see suffering from disparities to engage them and help them to create opportunities for change in their lives Mm -hmm. Uh, use mediums like like this internet radio we need to use every available medium to bring the education disparity and the gap together so does that mean, and I, just my takeaway from that is along with internet radio, getting more of those leaders, community leaders that have a voice on other social mediums like Absolutely. television, um, Facebook, because, you know, they've got the Facebook Live now. Yeah. Taking the time to do YouTube vlogs. You know, I, I just recently found out what vlog was. <laughs> I had no idea. I know I'm probably telling on myself, but, you know, I believe in being transparent (laughs) and authentic. So we just have to rise up. And that means taking time. Absolutely. You know, time to develop messages that are relatable. Yeah. That are authentic because, you know, millennials and children and adults, especially those that have encountered any kind of trauma or distrust in the system, they can pretty much tell when you're being sincere. Absolutely. Or if you're just trying to 
gain a buck, you know, mm-hmm. gain a dollar. Mm-hmm. And so I believe we just need as leaders, it is our task. And I know that I have taken on that task as much as I can in an, in, as an individual. And I know you as a community leader has as well. But I just want to implore and encourage and empower, even from our listening audience, mm-hmm. those listeners, those leaders that feel like that they can relate to everything that we're sharing here today and we're discussing, use this as the motivation that you need to connect with other leaders in your community, to come together, to be a collective voice. Um, that is that is our goal and that is our assignment. And if you are already in a capacity of leader, then you've already figured out what your purpose is so let's help our millennials find out what their purpose is you know and what their passion is and a lot of times when people ask me well what is your purpose and how did you find it I ask them this question well what is your passion what do you like to do what do you like to do that will impact the lives of others? What is the first thing that you think about when you wake up and the last thing that you think about when you go to bed that you would do if you had the money to do it? Mm-hmm. That is your passion. And your passion is persuasive because people patronize you, not because of what you offer, because many other people can offer the same thing. Right. They patronize you because of what you bring, your energy. So right. what is your passion? Your passion is persuasive. And that will help you to find your purpose, which will in turn bring change, the change that we're discussing today. Absolutely. And and so I'm just, I'm excited about, (laughs) you know what excites me? What excites me is bringing a gleam to the eyes of a person that no longer has that gleam. You know, it, it, it doesn't that excite you? Doesn't that empower you to want to just even do greater things, greater exploits? Absolutely. Yes. yes. And you know, Michelle, another thing we can do as community leaders and voices, um, we always try to tap into the church, mm. you know, get the preachers together. But I think it's time for us to start lobbying big business. Yes. And, and and moving towards them with meetings mm-hmm. and showing them ways that they can serve the community because they have a pool of volunteers in their organization mm-hmm. that would be a benefit to bringing a new level of it. They, they could have reading programs mm-hmm. if it was just for their employees' children. Right. But we would see business, big business, um, closing the gap mm-hmm. of the disparity. I think it's time for us to think big, mm-hmm. and that will enhance our voice. Because a lot of times, you, you, you know, we try to go to pastors. They're busy. They have four or five programs that they're doing already. Mm -hmm. And then plus the the load Mm -hmm. of carrying the ministry. Right. But I think we've got to move into another posture Mm -hmm. of now, you know, being bold enough to go to these businesses in our community. We're grateful that they brought jobs. Right. But there's some other things that you can do. That you can offer. Yeah. Right. That that would close this gap. So that is one solution. And thank you for that. So there is a history to everything. So how did we come to such a place where the educational disparities amongst our various communities have become so apparent? And where did all of this stem from? Um, The history, as I know it, I'm going to offer what I know right. about it. From um, your perspective. In, in, I think it was either New York or New Jersey where the Head Start program first started. Okay. Um, See, I just learned something. That was today. why. <laughs> <laughs> and I was trying to remember her name. Right. But sh- she was the one that started the Head Start program. Okay. Because children were getting to elementary school. Mm-hmm. And most of the first grade was spent um, doing remedial learning. Right, because they weren't and think, prepared. Right. right. They, they needed pre-K, mm-hmm. K. So when when you look at that, the, the start of the Head Start program, and at first it was designed for the underserved communities. Right. But when it took off, it became available to everyone. Okay. And I believe that they let that vision die, and it just became a program 
of, you know, doing pre-K, K, and K, now K-4. Okay. But if we could get back to teaching the children how to read, teaching them math, mm -hmm. teaching them Basic critical math, thinking, right. you know, how to solve problems. And we, we were made to learn that right. in elementary school. Right. We, so for we, my listening audience, the solutions are coming forward. So I hope you're taking notes. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. You. That's okay. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's so apparent now because the internet has opened our world. World. Yes, it has. The world is at your front door. You can Google just about anything. Right. Wikipedia. So, I mean, I yeah. don't know how accurate some of the Wikipedia is, but. But years ago, um, we, we didn't have any medium. Mm -hmm. You know, you and I didn't have any medium no. where we could sit down and speak to millions of people at one time about right. anything. Right. But now we, we have Internet. We, we have Facebook. We have the blogs. We have um stumble upon Instagram all all types of periscope yeah, Paris, yeah. <laughs> all types of mediums right. now so what people are doing is they're making apparent what used to be hidden mm -hmm. and so now you can talk about things and have a voice right. there we go again go. about things where, where before we didn't have a voice and hopefully it'll be an educated voice, voice hopefully. not someone hopefully. just wanting to have a voice just to have a voice yes <laughs> So there are way more small businesses in our local communities than there are larger corporations. And I hear a lot of talk about businesses partnering with education. As a small business owner, what can I actually do? Like what steps can I actually take to get access to our underserved youth to help them prepare for businesses or the workforce? And whom do we connect with? As a small business owner, mm -hmm. That wants to get involved. Yeah, I see. Yeah. But what can you actually do? Steps that you can take. Mm -hmm. I don't know how small your business is, but the first thing I would do would be to connect with someone like Michelle Speaks or connect with organizations that are already operating and functional. Find a grassroots organization mm -hmm. that you can help fund. Mm -hmm. um, ask your employees to do some volunteer hours. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe reading a book or teaching a child math. You may have employees that's good with algebra. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a must have because algebra is life. Mm -hmm. So as a small business owner, those are some things you could do without it actually touching your budget. Right. And creating a deficit in okay. your income. Come. Okay. So you, you gain access. I would go through a reputable program to serve the youth. Or if you had the access and ability to do it, you could start a program at your business mm -hmm. um, of training young people how to work um, in your in whatever your small business is, mm -hmm. equipping them with some skills and then teaching them business. Mm hmm. And so I hope you're listening to my listening audience. These were several other solutions, you know, to how to bridge the gap between the educational disparities. And it's not just educational disparities, though. That is the overall topic. Mm -hmm. There's many subtopics, you know, within what we're discussing. You know, there's the health disparities. There's the mental health disparities. Uh, All of it is connected because if your mindset, as Dr. Clark um, mentioned earlier, if your mindset is not right, then even with all of the resources that are available to you, you won't be in the right mental state to be able to partake of those um, resources. And so I want to thank you for sharing that. Um, something that you mentioned earlier, too, you said, I wanted you to talk more about a solution that you had actually already implemented here in the local community, the education academic arcade program, you know, and how impactful was that? And if it is still active and if it's not how we can work together to reactivate that. Um, the program is no longer active. Okay. What made the program so successful is that we had a captive audience. We operated the 
apartment community where we were mm -hmm. gave us two units that mm -hmm. we could set up an office. Mm -hmm. we, we received a grant from the city okay, and we purchased televisions um, and computers and games. Mm -hmm. And once we had it set up, we'd open up the program and we went and talked to the parents, told them how important it was. We didn't have a problem because most of the children were failing right. in school. So okay. when they found out that they could get help right in their community, mm -hmm. then they would bring the children. And the children were eager to come because they would get to play games right. that they didn't have access to. Mm -hmm. Now, if I were going to do that again, I would, I would go to a low-income housing property. Okay. But you would need funding. You need right. somebody to to fund it. And then you need to get to the property owner, mm -hmm. not just the manager. Yeah. The owner okay. needs to see the passion and the vision and say, okay, I will give you an apartment right. to operate in. Okay. And, you know, in that apartment community, not only were we able to improve the academics, but it also created resident retention. Mm hmm so that that's important in in a community like right. that, and and say that part one more time just in case my the res, resident right. retention right right uh, because not only did we educate in book study, uh, we taught housekeeping skills mm, much needed, <laughs> and in low income housing, they have to pass um, inspections, mm -hmm. and so you have to know how to clean certain mm -hmm. ways to mm -hmm. pass the inspection. Right. So we did housekeeping seminars. Um, there were a group of of residents that really you would look up and say, "Why are you here? Mm -hmm. You know what what are you doing with your life?" Right. And then so we get them. I bought how to Mavis Beacon, learning how to type. Right. And, and they've got so much to offer on right. Mavis Beacon. Yeah. So I I would buy programs like that and ask them to spend one hour with me. Mm -hmm. What just one hour a week spend that hour with me learning to type. Right. And then I would move on to word processing. Right. And I I mean, we had, I think it was like 30 people moved into Applejack's housing. Wow. To, yeah, just to move. They just needed the help. They needed to know that someone was there that really cared about what That they, will take them through the process step right. by step. Right. And you know what I believe I'm hearing in that is consistency. But what I'm also hearing from it, the leadership standpoint is that you have to be willing to take the time to invest. Absolutely. In not just the children, but the parents. Yeah, and we, we couldn't do it all. We had to right. connect with other And you can't do it alone. Right. Mm -hmm. We had to connect. And there were other grassroots organizations. organizations. Yeah. When we showed them what that we were doing, they bought the piece that they were doing. So we ended up with a comprehensive program. And that takes the emphasis off of personal achievements, mm -hmm. what I've achieved. Look at me and what I've accomplished. It just, together we can accomplish so much more. And so, you know, I'm hearing that as a resounding theme as well, that mm -hmm. as community leaders, you know, those of you that are in your communities and maybe you're a little bit frustrated about why I'm not making a bigger, having a bigger impact. You know, let this be a reminder that you can't do it alone. You cannot end educational disparities in your community all by yourself. You no. cannot end health disparities in the community by yourself. Mental health, you know, mm -hmm. disparities. Mm -hmm. You have to connect with other organizations. Mm -hmm. And so I, I believe that is also very crucial and very key. And I kind of wanted you to kind of touch on as well something that you said earlier that just kind of resonated with me. You said we've created, you know, the class system or subsystem. It's not segregation is no longer about color. It's all about money. Mm -hmm. We're money driven. We're a money driven community. We're a money driven society. Where do you think that shift? Where did that come? When did that become come into play? It has always been about money. Okay. Okay. All we could see was skin, mm -hmm. but at the root of it, it was always about money. Mm -hmm. From the Willie Lynch letter mm -hmm. up till now, when you really examine the system, there are people that will spend $25 for a hamburger if they don't have to sit at a table close to you. Wow. Okay. Right. 
But there are other people fussing about spending $4 mm-hmm. for a hamburger. Wow. Okay. So I don't tell you you can't come and eat at my restaurant. Right. I just set my prices so at a range you can't afford it. that you wouldn't want to come. So again, it's back to mindset. So, you know, I I hope you hear the resounding theme here as well from our listening audience. It's about one, mindset. (laughs) Right. And two, it's about really, truly knowing what your purpose is and knowing that it's more than just about you. You know, me and mine. Mm -hmm. Me and my four and no more. And Michelle, look what's happening now Um, in the school system. They're fixing it so... You you don't you're not forced to go to your neighborhood school. You can go to any school that your parent can afford can take you. Mm. Okay. Creating and then look at the mindset system. of a lot of parents. Mm-hmm. It's all they can do to get to work. Can't miss a day. Right. So who's going to take their child to a magnet program or another program? Who is going to recognize? And you have to know the potential of your own child. Right. You, you have to examine them and, and see and know their purpose right. and their potential. Right. So that you can di- direct them and project them mm-hmm. in a positive and right way. Um, when it comes to parental involvement in, in helping with the disparities in education, mm-hmm. as a parent, I, you know, I would study my child and first search for where they're struggling, what's mm-hmm. missing. And if you have the internet, I would look for internet games and programs mm-hmm. and require them to do those programs and those games mm-hmm. at, at least an hour a day. So if they are struggling in math, you would get a math program. Mm-hmm. And to them, they're playing. But right. you understand they're that educated. they're learning mm-hmm. math techniques. Right. That they're being educated. Mm-hmm. And there are so many programs out there. There's one my favorite was um, Leap Star, Leap, Leap Frog, Leap, Leap Frog. Leap Frog. Mm-hmm. That was one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. The kids seemed to love it. I, I mean, their vocabulary changed mm-hmm. just from doing the programs. Mm-hmm. The colors, numbers, sight words was all easy because they were using the computer, and that's right. where we we're going. Right. So, as a parent, I would start there and and really find out from my child. What what do you feel you need? Right. Because we would not have been su- as successful as we were. We did that program for 14 years. Right. And we would not have been as successful had, had we gone in and said, we know what you need. And right. we bring in what you, so we you had have to, start to be able doing, to identify mm-hmm. the need. What is it you, you feel like you need? Right, right. And, and you know, that goes back to as parents, you have to invest the time in your children mm-hmm. to figure out, you know, what where their skills lie or where their skills need to be improved upon. Um. And that takes time. So for the parent that says, well, I don't have time, you know, how do how how do we help that parent? Well, the parent that doesn't have time, you have neighbors. Mm -hmm. I would get to know my neighbors Mm -hmm. and and call just have a neighbor neighborhood meeting, Mm -hmm. you know, have some refreshments and, and ask them. Are your children having any problems in school? Mm -hmm. Is there a subject that they need help in? Mm -hmm. Can we partner together to help our children improve? Right. So there are solutions. That's that's what I wanted to get at. Yeah. There are solutions, Mm -hmm. you know, to whatever impediment or roadblock that you feel that you have. There are solutions. So do you feel the restructuring of the standardization test and college boards in an effort to help address the educational deficiencies and cultural differences has contributed to the problem? And does this effort make things better or worse? In my opinion, uh, we've always been tested. Mm-hmm. As far as I can remember in school, okay, yes. there was always some standardized testing right. that we had to do. I don't think that 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 is the problem. I do feel that it weeds out those persons who cannot learn mm-hmm. or who are not privileged to um, retain 
and recall information as well. I'll mm-hmm. say it like that. It's not okay. that you can't learn. Right. But if I teach you, all you need to do is this to pass the test. Mm-hmm. And if you're not motivated to learn anything else, mm-hmm. then you can get as far as seventh grade mm-hmm. and not be able to read. Mm-hmm. Okay. Gotcha. So when, when you look at that, I, I cannot say that the effort made things better or worse. I think pre- what has happened and prevailed across the board is the busyness of mm. parents okay. and then the lack of two having two parents in the home right um creating a financial disparity mm-hmm. uh, i think across the board it, it has a lot to do with younger mothers mm-hmm. having that that are not reared themselves they're not right. mature enough to, to even recognize the importance of some things so I, I I don't believe the system is at fault mm-hmm. I believe that the system in an attempt to correct the problem created another problem okay but it's it's not going to change because again it's about green right right and so the system is not the problem Problem, but in an attempt to address it, they've created another problem. Yes, ma'am. Or multiple problems. <laughs> <laughs> so we definitely can't change a, um, a mindset about that is money oriented. No, no. But we can do our part to help bridge that gap. We can. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I applaud uh, the school board, the school board system, our leaders, our community leaders. I, I applaud them. Mm -hmm. Because it takes something to know that you're out front and you've got to say the right thing. Right. You've got to know the right thing, right. even when you don't know. Exactly. And and so for them to put forth that effort, I, I think is notable. I do believe that um, we can become more involved. Most of us have, have never visited our chamber. Mm-hmm. And we have we have a black chamber, and we have and we have the regular chamber. chamber. Yeah, right. uh, we we're not involved with Urban League, mm-hmm. and so there are a lot of things in our community, places where we can have a voice that we don't take advantage of. Mm-hmm. And the people have become discouraged in providing the service because they haven't been able to get the community to buy into what they're bringing. Okay. I love it. I love it. I love it. (laughs) So what I want you to do, um, Dr. Clark, is first share with me, our listening audience, what has been or is the secret or key to your success? Hmm. Michelle, the secret, the key to my success, success (laughs) has been Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, Inviting him into my life Mm -hmm. and then giving my life to him Mm -hmm. he showed me my purpose Mm -hmm. and pointed me in the right direction Mm -hmm. and I obeyed so it's a difference in knowing and obeying than just knowing say that one more time (laughs) there's a difference in knowing and obeying I just wanted you guys to get that to my (laughs) listening audience than just knowing My passion is to help people improve the quality of their lives. Yes. And And I believe that's why I felt so connected to you when we first met, because we share that passion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what has been one of your defining moments? Uh, One of my defining moments would have been I was chosen um, through a program of the city of Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. To receive the Ripple Effect Award, okay, as a um, faith-based leader in wow. the city, that's an honor. That that meant a lot to me because I was like unknown, I thought, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it was just such a privilege and an honor. It humbled me mm-hmm. more than it made me proud. I was like, wow. wow. I am really being effective. Right. I am affecting and people's with that lives. Comes responsibility. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So it's Thank you. the Ripple Effect Award. And I have the key to the city of Orlando. Wow. That was a defining moment. Okay. Um, as an entrepreneur, I used to travel and and do programs mm-hmm. to help people start and develop business. Right. And I I did one in Orlando, and as a result of that, 
the mayor at that time gave me the key to the city. So that's, that was that that's was some defining. An, that's an awesome honor. What I want you to do, Dr. Clark, is to share with our listening audience how they can connect with you if they have questions, how they can follow you. And then I'm going to wrap up what we shared today and um yeah, let them know how they can reach out to you and give them one takeaway or call to action. Okay. One call to action, make a decision for Ooh. change and then act on your decision. Um, they can reach me mm-hmm. at Pride in Action, Jax, that's Pride in Action, J-A-X at gmail.com or go to our website, D Clark Ministries, that's D Clark Ministries dot org, and you'll find further information about me and the programs that we have in the community. Awesome, awesome, awesome. For my listening audience, today you have been um, educated, you have been. I'm just speechless and, you know, I know I need to wrap up, but I just had to take all of that in. So what I want to leave with you, just to give you an overview, Dr. Clark said it must first start with a voice and then that voice must be loud. It must be strong and it must have a resonating message. That is the thing that is essential to us bridging the gap between educational disparities in our underserved communities versus our privileged communities. And not only that, must you have a voice and it be loud and strong and have a message. In order for you to take part in that, you have to make the decision to change. And so thank you for my listening audience. You've been listening to Michelle Speaks with me, your host, Michelle Portier. And we've been talking about educational disparities in the community with my very special guest, the dynamic Dr. Diane Clark. Dr. Clark, thank you so much for sharing with our audience your experience, your insight, your wisdom, and your knowledge. Thank you. Tune in to us every Thursday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All of our shows are available in our podcast directory for free 24-7 by going to 180radionow.com forward slash podcast or click the podcast link in the menu on the homepage. Click the Michelle Speaks logo and you can access all of our previously aired shows. And I want to make the caveat that Michelle Speaks Speaks is with a Z. Download the 180 Radio Now app on Google Play and the Apple App Store. You can also listen directly on the 180radionow.com website by clicking the Listen Live button at the top of the homepage. Also, listen through your web browser on every major internet radio directory, iTunes Radio, TuneIn, Radio.com, Streama, Screamer Radio, and more. It is our sincere prayer that what you've heard today has blessed you and provided you with information you can use to help you in your situation or someone else's. Tune in again as we get to the heart of the matter, because if you hide it, you can't heal it. 